So good morning. Let us start talking about trajectory planning. Trajectory planning uh, is uh, quite a huge topic uh, in, uh, in robotics. We don't have uh, the time to do it uh, in this uh, first, and I mean, the only class of robotics you're going to meet in, uh, in, uh, in this master's degree. So I'm going to give you just a brief overview of what is motion and trajectory planning, what are motion control, motion uh, planning. And then we will focus uh, on a specific aspect of trajectory planning that will be needed for your projects. Let us see a little bit uh, difference between motion control and motion planning. <coughs> Let us assume that I need to plan my trajectory from here to my office. If I need to plan my trajectory from here to my office, I need to make some uh, considerations about all the possibilities. I can go to the first floor and then to the terrace or to the ground floor and take in the elevator. I don't know if I'm going to meet some obstacles during my path because I don't know what's going on there. So I need to make uh, a global <coughs> planning. I need to make uh, some considerations uh, and uh, some also <coughs> probabilistic considerations uh, on what plan is better than the other. From the mathematical point of view, if I consider a robot, motion planning means to find all the configuration at each instant time, so all the time history of the configuration from the origin to a certain final time in order to reach the desired final configuration. And actually, you have uh, infinite possibilities. As I said, I can go through the first uh, floor or to the ground floor. I can also make a round of the building and go in my office. What are the differences? Well, clearly, we are engineers. If there are infinite possibilities, we try to um, optimize some energy-related matrix. Okay? But the point is that uh, if I do have uh, infinite possibilities, I have uh, a computational uh, AV problem. No? From the mathematical point of view, this is a two points boundary problem. We are not going to enter into uh, this detail now. And this is usually done offline. Actually, motion planning is very popular now because it's what is done by any map application on your smartphone. This is motion planning. Uh, I need to go from here to another town, you just give the exact address, uh, and it makes some computation in order to find what is the best route. But of course, it's global. I don't have uh, any punctual information on what I'm going to, to meet. If I have constraints, the constraints increase the computational time. What does it mean? My robot uh, has a fixed robot and needs to, to pick and place objects on that table. If I do have a lot of other objects to be avoided, the computational time increases. Okay? I can have issues. I need to take properly into account uh, dynamic environments. Here, dynamic means environments that are changing with time. I, need, I just plan the motion of my robot and there is an operator that comes inside. The operator is moving, so it's changing my constraints. And this can be, I mean, uh, needs to be taken into account, of course. Eventually, 
incremental maps. What does it mean? If I want to go from here to my office and I do have a perfect uh, map of all the building, I have the information required to, to build my path. But uh, if I don't have it, when I go out from the door, I build my map. Okay? I use my sensor and I see what's going on. I need to build my map and to plan my trajectory, take into account that I'm moving and building my map together. The good point with motion planning is if I have global information, I avoid local minimum. We will see next slide uh, a graphical example of a lo local minimum. On the other hand, the opposite to motion planning is motion control. Uh, terminology m may change depending on the literature, but uh, this, this is the one that I decide to use. Motion control is local, is reactive, and this is what we are going to do more or less. Mathematically, here I want the velocity at that moment. I want to go. I want to move my my uh, arm from here to here. There is an obstacle. I don't plan all the trajectory from here. I just go straight. When there is an obstacle, I decide locally to avoid it. Okay. Uh, of course, this is much faster, and uh, this is needed online. I want to go to my office. The students come over. I didn't know in advance when I made my motion planning, so I need to react locally. Okay, online in real time. I, know, I don't want to stop my robot. It's easier with respect to the other, so that's to the motion planning. That's why it's relatively easy. Uh, the two problems from the mathematical, mathematical aspects uh, are quite different. This is a little bit easier. And I can handle the constraints, always local, cons locally. Okay? I can avoid the uh, hitting obstacle. This is not an issue. I can handle dynamic environment, I can handle incremental map easier, but I can be trapped in local minima. If my uh, motion is totally based on local information, I can easily get trapped. And we will see now one example. I have a trilling robot. I need to go from uh, the red, the red ball to the green one, there aren't any obstacles, so everything is very easy. However, a reactive planner, a planner that only said, says to the algorithm, okay, let's go from the end effector from here to here, following a segment, because it's the shorter path. A reactive planner here finds an obstacle and always try to go to the green one, okay? It's a very stupid way to think. I just you know, get pulled by the green ball and, and get trapped in a local minimum. It's very easy to get trapped in local minimum, okay? So if I only have a local view of my environment, uh, the possibility to get trapped in local minimum is quite frequent. Okay, but I can use uh, Motion planning, what does it mean? I try different way. I try. It's a probabilistic approach. I sample. I just say, okay, let's try in this other direction, in this other direction. And in the end, I find a possible way to reach the green ball. Seems to be nice. Well, if the environment is dynamic, so it means if the obstacle is actually moving, I need to replan. I need to adapt. And for example, one small movement, as this one, can uh, cause, let me say, an incremental movement of the robot. However, our system is uh, strong, sorry, is strong in nonlinear, and it can arrive that uh, in order to reach my uh, target, I may need uh, to change totally the, co the configuration of the robot. In this case, I found first uh, a solution 
of this kind, and then I need to reconfigure totally my robot from one configuration to the other, upper elbow to the lower elbow. So what does it mean? It means that, uh, I mean, planning a motion is something that uh, is not easy, needs to, you know, to be taken properly into account. There are a lot of uh, approaches, and unfortunately, we are not going to, to study this problem. We are, only, we are simply going to, uh, today, to define properly a trajectory, and I will, I will, uh, I mean, we will see later trajectory in the in the and the factor as time law. Okay. Well, the solution uh, in a real application in advanced robotics, uh, all the solutions uh, are always based to this kind of approach. We have uh, a reactive approach that is running at high frequency, so in real time and uh, a planning that is working at low frequency, in background. So in background, in background uh, I decide uh, to take the highway or to take uh, uh, the coastal road, and in real time I decided uh, to stop at the crossroads. Okay, those are the two different approaches. Uh, let me show you a video taken by Daniele about a, Daniele has been uh, guest of uh, uh, McGill University at Kinova last, uh, last, uh, last year for four months and made some work on this motion planning, motion control. <coughs> now, the first uh, test is very easy. There aren't any obstacles and I just uh, want to follow the end effector by taking into account some additional constraints, joint limits, virtual wall, obstacle avoidance, and end effector, okay? And this is very easy because there are no obstacles. The, the trajectory that is identified uh, is a, a green segment, the shortest path, everything is nice, and we are happy with the plan. Okay, static environment with obstacle. If the environment is, is static, uh, it means that uh, we do have the obstacle here. You see there is a marker to simplify the code. So we just use uh, a library available in internet that recognizes the markers and so the position orientation in, in, uh, in Cartesian space and we use it to uh, recognize the obstacle. Okay, it's just to have it easier. And this is what motion planning uh, uh, produced. We, we, we have a certain algorithm, we sample, and we find something that uh, does not hit, hit the obstacle and is very, it satisfies all the constraints. And so, in this case too, it is very easy. Uh, locally, we are running our reactive uh, algorithm. Everything is static, so we don't need to change uh, the trajectory from the planet one. Fine. We are, we are happy again, and we can grasp our object. And then a dynamic environment. A dynamic environment, uh, we need to replan, but we need at the same time to take into account that, you see, an obstacle entered into the planet plot, so we need to replan, but at the same time, we need to take into account all the constraints in real time. So the two algorithms are running together. <coughs> Background, the motion planning, in real time, the reactive control, in order to guarantee always a safe trajectory. Let us see Another example, this was uh, uh, for a European project uh, that is going to finish this year, and uh, uh, we did uh, propose 
the same, but for um, a uh, system with a, a larger number of degrees of freedom. Now we have a quad rotor that has uh, um, four degrees of freedom, not six, because the quad, quad rotor, you cannot control roll and pitch independently. So you can control X, Y, Z, and U. So we have four degrees of freedom for the base, and the robot here, uh, I don't remember, I don't think it is six, or four or six. So we have uh, eight or 10 degrees of freedom for this system. We want to follow the state line from the, the green to, uh, from the red to the green uh, uh, ball. And now, uh, this has been done by Elisabetta. Uh, she is uh, interacting in real time. Uh, this blue rectangle is an obstacle, and with uh, uh, arrays, she is moving it in real time. In the beginning, the robot uh, does not find uh, a solution. The robot recognizes that there is something in the path, need to replan. The time it's taking to replan uh, is too long, and so now it's making a, an emergency stop and replanning. Find another path, is following the path. Then there is, uh, is replanning in background now because there is the time to do it. And you can appreciate here that, you know, from this one, changing this other one. And then the obstacle moved again. And the system always replan in real time. <laughs> avoiding uh, not only the obstacle, but also the mechanical joint limits, okay? Then uh, here you, you can see that uh, this is not very nice. It's making really a uh, large deviation. In this specific case, for this animation, uh, we haven't implemented yet the background optimization. Even if there are not obstacles, it's always optimized uh, the, the path in background. Okay, so now uh, this would have been avoided because once here, it could just, you know, go straight to the, the, the green ball. Okay. So this is what is needed in, uh, in a real robotic applications, in real life. But uh, we, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, it depends, uh, we need to, 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 to stay at the uh, credits allocated for this class. And so we, are, we, are, we need to, we are going to focus our attention only on trajectory planning. Yes? Uh, no, no we, we are going to use uh, sampling based uh, strategies, not, not uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, in those examples that you showed us, they were doing reinforcement? Or no, 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 no. Samp a sample based algorithm is a stochastic approach where you basically sample. And what we do is uh, we sample in the Cartesian space. So what we, we used to say, the magic end, as, as you have uh, six degrees of freedom end. And then uh, you need to verify that you are able to follow, I mean, the trajectory, and you make a kinematic inversion during the motion plan. This is what we usually do. Other possibility is that you sample directly here in the joint space. It's, it's a little bit more easy from the computational aspect. So we need to... to to simply focus our attention on trajectory planning. So we are going to basically say here, What we 
we are going to do today is to properly design a desired trajectory. Okay? This could be a desired trajectory for the end effect. We first start with a desired trajectory for a generic variable, for example, for the joint. And then in the end, we, on today's lesson, we will learn how to properly generate a trajectory for the position and orientation of the end effect. And this is what we are going to do in, the, uh, in the practice also next Monday, and you will need it for uh, the, the exam. Okay, so this is what we are going to do uh, today, and uh, just uh, why we do need to uh, generate a desired trajectory. If I want to go from A to B, why can't I just say, okay, let's go to B. This is your target, B. From the mathematical aspect, I say, okay, you are in A, and at T0, I want you go in B. It means that if this is uh, a certain desired variable, for example, I, I, TD, I will change uh, label because it's really not important. If this is my desired variable, I'm telling to my robot, but in, to any feedback uh, control system, look, you need to go from A, a to B and at T0. So, I'm giving a set point. You know, this is a regulation problem. Well, my controller, assuming that uh, here the controller has a zero error because I'm tracking perfectly the, the given trajectory, my controller sees a discontinuity in the error. Because at a certain point, I say, okay, but at T0, I have an error of uh, uh, B minus A. And this discontinuity is a problem is a problem for the controllers, it is a problem for the mechanics of the robots. I want to avoid these continuities. Okay. In industrial robot, if you go if you um, give discontinuous references to the low level uh, controller, actually the manufacturer just filter your desired position. And they always make an interpolation in order to avoid it. This discontinuity means uh, a discontinuity in the force, in the actuation. It means that uh, what is going to, 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 to happen is you reduce the life of the gears. You reduce the life uh, of your mechanical uh, structure. Okay? So you usually don't give a set point to a mechanical system. Usually try to smooth a little bit the rest. Let me see, okay, I can smooth, I can say, okay, this is TF, this is the reference trajectory. It's a little, bit of a little bit better than the previous one, okay? But I can also say, oh, but well, I want to, to give you this trajectory. What is the difference between this one and this one? The derivative? Okay, here I have the derivative is zero. Then I have a discontinuous in the derivative, so in the velocity, and then zero. Here I draw it a little bit more smooth. Okay, so for example, this is discontinuous in the acceleration, not in the velocity. And uh, what's surprising is that uh, you do need to have. Uh, uh, continuity or at least uh, until the, the, the velocity. This is the minimum requirement. But uh, the, in the industrial environment uh, they do want uh, continuity up to the acceleration or even up to the jerk. Okay? If you use a circle, okay, an arc, 
gravity is continuous in the curvature rate. And uh, this is, uh, can be, because it's not done in that way, this can be a, a trouble for the driver. Because it's done not, so it, it, it does not follow the dynamics of a car that is continuous in, in the force. So we, we cannot provide this continuity in uh, the path of our car. And the same for the railway. If you have needed, if uh, this was a railway and you need to connect, a discontinuity in the, in the uh, curvature radius uh, reduces the life uh, of all the mechanical, uh, um, all the mechanical devices in the, in the train, but is also unpleasant to the person on the, to the traveler, travelers on the train. Okay. So continuity is important, uh, even for the path generation in a non-robotics application, or always mechanical application, and the same for, uh, for uh, a mechanical, uh, uh, for a robot, that is, of course, a mechanical application. Uh, as a curiosity, uh, now, several years ago, something like uh, 15 years ago, we worked uh, uh, in, a, in a consultant for uh, Comau, that is an Italian manufacturer of robots, to generate trajectory continuous up to the jerk that fulfilled uh, several constraints, Cartesian joint and several other constraints. Okay, so it is an industrial requirement. We want to have uh, uh, smooth enough trajectories. Okay, a definition. When I talk about path, path is a geometric concept. Okay, path is the locus of the points that I want to follow. When I use the term trajectory, I give a time loop to the path. Okay, path is geometric, trajectory is a geometric plus time. Okay, we are going to build a trajectory planning next Monday, and this will be a function with as input the path definition, the eventual path constraints, you always have constraints, additional constraints given by the robot dynamics, you will not have it in your in your, in your uh, um, projects. And then, as output, uh, your function will provide the trajectory. It could be joint trajectory or end effect or position and orientation at each sample time. So a sequence of points to be followed by the controller. This is what you are going to do next Monday. And uh, we are going to study today this one of the simplest way to do it. Okay, so we are going to study a very simple algorithm, but still that has some interest that can be implemented in in, in the lab, for example. Okay, so how, how do I provide my path? Well, usually I give. Uh, initial and final points, okay? For example, and the factor say, okay, from A to B, that's it. I can give you some via points, some intermediate points. If I need to, to, to make the, the wealth of uh, the chassis of a car in an industrial environment, I give uh, all the list of the point where you need to stop to make the weld. okay? So there are, I don't know. 100 points for, uh, for a, a small piece of the car. I just give you the list. Okay, you have the task to uh, develop the trajectory, but it is important that you, you pass in those points. And then I can also uh, say, okay, those via points, you need to stop there because I need to, to weld. 
So you need to stop for one second. Or you can pass by with this velocity. If I need to uh, glue, to release the glue, I have to do it at a certain velocity. Okay? I cannot stop, otherwise I accumulate the glue. I cannot be too fast, otherwise the glue is too thin and so on. So there are some constraints uh, depending on the application. Mm. Uh, geometric primitives, as I say, I can require an arc or I need to have more complex geometric uh, curves that are continuous in the radius, clotoids, for example, something that is studied in uh, civil engineering, uh, not in information one, because they need to, to, uh, to know how to build uh, the band of an highway. Then uh, I give, okay, you have to do it uh, in tot seconds, so total time, or maximum velocities and or maximum accelerations or all. And uh, velocity and acceleration given points is what I say. So I can assign a lot of constraints depending on what is the application. Okay? Actually, I can also assign the maximum torque Maximum torque and maximum acceleration are not the same, of course, but we will study in, in dynamics uh, next, uh, next weeks. Okay, so I have all those constraints uh, and input for my algorithm. Okay, we do have uh, the possibilities to assign the trajectory in the operational space or in joint space. Of course, I work 99% of my time in the operational space because it is where my application is. My, the real world is uh, in Cartesian space. Then I can have some uh, joint space trajectory for uh, specific situations. For example, to, to escape from a kinematic singularity, okay? Mm. But the problem is always the same. My control action is in a joint space. My motors are at the joint. So I need always to pass from one space to the other. Okay. Now, let us first start with the joint space trajectory. What we are going to do will be used also for the Cartesian space trajectory. Okay, we want to find a function that interpolates from uh, an initial to the final value, we want an argument that is light, of course. Mm, we want continuity in position, of course, velocity, eventually accelerations. Uh, we will see one possibility with the discontinuities in acceleration that is used. We want the minimization of the undesired effect, uh, is what I said. We want a regular curvature. Undesired effects is a generic term here. Okay, just to say I want a regular path. Okay, and we will see a point to point motion. We are not going to see uh, the motion through via points. Okay, only the point to point motion. Okay. Okay, we, we like to optimize stuff. So if I want to go from uh, an initial to the final position with a certain final time, I have infinite possibilities. So I can, I can do something like that, something like that. You know, I have infinite possibilities. Why shall I erase this possibility or what is the difference between those two I just impose a mathematical problem uh, and optimize some metrics in order to have uh, a, a solution to start with the optimization problem is uh, a classical result in control theory we are not going to do it we are only going to to to, to, to um, to see a, a plot of what kind of solution is, he say, okay, among all the infinite possible trajectory, I want to minimize 
the integral of uh, the square of the force. Okay. Force is a linear point or torque if we are talking about rotational movements. This is the matrix that I want to minimize. Okay? Classical results in control theory, the solution uh, is uh, quadratic in the velocity. What does it mean? It means that if you look at the second equation, the solution is uh, a polynomial of order 2. It means that it is cubic in the position. So let us take a generic uh, cubic polynomial. We do have uh, four parameters, okay? It means that, uh, this, okay, the, this is of course the velocity, it's just the time derivative, and this is the acceleration. It means that I can select, for I can impose four constraints. For example, if you look, position and initial time, velocities, velocity at initial time, position at the final time, velocity at the final time. Linear system with the four equations and four unknowns, A0, A1, A2, and 3. This is linear, okay? Look, uh, Tf cube, Tf square, those are numbers because Tf has been fixed. The unknown are A0, A1, A2, and A3, so it is linear very easy, I can find the solution, okay? But this is only a mathematical solution, because if I plot, if I plot one example, this is one example, I want to go from zero to pi in uh, one second, okay? And I want to stop at the, I want to start with zero velocity, I want to stop at the final time. It means that I do have uh, all the information here. QI is zero. Q dot I is zero. QF is pi. Q dot F is zero. I just make the inversion of the matrix with the coefficients, but here I have a zero is zero, a one is zero. A substitute is very easy. It can be done by end. And what is important is that, okay, I know QDT. QDT is this one. I just plotted uh, this expression, okay? QT is equal this cubic polynomial. I plotted with the numbers that attend, the numbers that we have, and this is the position. The position looks very nice. The, 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 the function of the position over the time is smooth. I'm going from zero to pi, I'm, I'm okay, I'm happy with that. However, look at the velocity. If uh, you were driving a car, ask it to go from one place to another, would you follow this velocity profile? Can you, can you see or, un or run, run 100 meters and stop in the end of 100 meters? Uh, do, you, do you understand what is the velocity profile, what you are doing? I reach a very fast uh, velocity and I break uh, arc from the car. No, you don't break arc. You, you are doing something a little bit different. Uh, you increase your velocity until uh, mid, uh, mid time, uh, mid distance, and then you decrease linearly because this is the acceleration. Okay, so it means that your motors are able to provide this maximum acceleration and this maximum velocity, but you are using them only at the very beginning here and you reach the maximum velocity here. Mathematically, you are optimizing a, a certain criteria. So this is mathematically a good solution, but from several other aspects, from several other engineering consideration, this is not very clever. What we do usually, 
if we want to run, we accelerate, we reach a cruise velocity, and we decelerate. Okay? And this is what uh, is also more appropriate from the force point of view, because we, we accelerate with a constant acceleration, and then we reach a cruise velocity with zero acceleration. Okay? Mathematical solution we are not going to implement. <coughs> Again, le 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 let us, fer before going to a practical solution, let us also uh, make another mathematical consideration. Here, the velocity is continuous, okay? The acceleration is not. Can I impose a continuity also in acceleration? Mm -hmm. Remaining in the same idea of using polynomials, I need the two other coefficients. Two other coefficients means that if this is a cubic polynomial, I can use a fifth order polynomial. Well, mathematically, yes. Practically, no. Because I'm increasing, <coughs> let me say, deviation in the, in, the, in the path. The behavior is not as smooth, as nice as, smooth it is smooth, sorry. It's not as uh, linear or as nice as we would expect as engineer, let me say. So the solution to go to high order polynomials is not uh, appropriate. Okay, what we are going to do is uh, to build uh, a pragmatic, a, but I mean, a pragmatic but a good way to, 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 to impose a solution. Uh, a pragmatic solution that is composed by the composition of three different segments. Let us start from the acceleration one. I accelerate at my maximum possibility. So I do exploit my motors at the maximum possibility. The velocity grows linearly until uh, a certain cruise velocity is reached, and then I accelerate. Position is continuous, velocity is continuous, acceleration is not, is discontinuous. Okay, I can accept a, a discontinuity in the acceleration. As I told you earlier, what we did uh, several years ago was to, to have continuity here too. And so to build another piece and the, the jerk profile, so the third order derivative and uh, this profile. Okay, so conceptually the problem is finished and now we only have uh, to work with uh, the constraints and with the numbers in order to find the solution. But conceptually, in the joint space, this is what uh, I, I ask you in the, in, the, in, the, in the course. Okay, I do assign initial final position and final time, and uh, Algorithmically, I discover, we are not going to go into the details, but I may assign the acceleration here or the cruise velocity. I cannot assign both because they are not independent one each other. Okay? Okay. The fact that I'm building uh, a, a um, the fact that I'm building here a continuous uh, position and velocity profile imposes some constraints. The constraints are here, uh, not going into the details of the constraints. Uh, we will uh, implement those constraints next uh, uh, Monday. The point is that I cannot assign arbitrarily, you know, for example, the acceleration time because everything is related. I need to accelerate, I need to have a certain cruise velocity and to decelerate, but in the end uh, I should stop here at final Q. So all the quantities are related one each other. And those are uh, the relationships among uh, the variables.
Okay, practically, again, here I'm going to be a little bit fast because next Monday you are going to implement this, okay? Practically, if the acceleration is given, you need to implement those in order to compute QT. So, the acceleration is given, you first need to to check that is high enough in order to reach the final time, uh, the final configuration in the final time. Then <coughs> you compute the switching time, and then you have uh, your QT. So QT is given by those equations. It's very easy. And this is one example. The acceleration is a uh, six pi, is given by the problem. I want to make uh, uh, the, the displacement from 0 to pi as the, in one second as the previous one if you look only at the position graphically it's hard to see differences with respect to the previous one okay? you have a first, a, a first uh, uh, quadratic growing then a linear growing on the position and again quadratic this is the velocity and this is the acceleration On the other end, I may assign the decreased velocity. I just have to check that it's properly assigned, cannot be too low or too large, and then I have the equations to compute the switching time, the acceleration, and this is QT. So very easy, few lines of code, okay? The function that, are, that you are going to build next Monday is this one. It's a function when in input you will have a, a, a vector, because scalar vector will be the same, a vector of initial uh, position, final position, cruise velocity, final time, a, and current time. Okay? The output is position, velocity, and acceleration at the current time. And this is uh, the way you should uh, write your MATLAB code. You have the definition of function, then the symbol uh, percentage is a comment, and uh, is green in MATLAB. All is a comment. If you write uh, help trapezoidal, in the directory where this function, the file is stored, MATLAB give you this one. And so you have the input, the output, the dimensions, and the description of what the function does. Okay, this is a proper way to build your, your, uh, your code. And uh, input and output are clear now. Here, I'm not going to detail now, next Monday. They are just here for reference. This is what you need to compute. This is the MATLAB implementation of the equation that we have seen earlier. So for example, delta is the displacement. displacement. This is for the I joint. The QCI is the cruise velocity for the I joint. You can have a different cruise velocity and so on. There are the dots, so it's not complete, of course. It's uh, your job next Monday to do it, okay? It's uh, just to, to touch a little bit with the ends. What does it mean to implement the equations? Okay, uh, before the break, I'm just going to give you the idea of what is the via point movement. Okay, we are not going to, to do it for the project, uh, we are not going to do it for the exam, but just the idea, I want to give you the idea. I have an initial point, a final point, and then several intermediate points. Well, from the pure mathematical aspect, each point is a constraint. Okay? And if I increase the order of the polynomial, I may mathematically satisfy the problem and pass through all the points. 
But if I said earlier that I don't like fifth order polynomial, you can imagine that I will never use a 20th order polynomial in order to interpolate because it's too rich in displacement, okay? And also the polynomials, they, they do exhibit numerical problems. Uh, you remember in Teoria dei Sistemi that the problems with the computation of the rank of the observability and controllability matrices, they were due to the polynomial nature of the function, of the matrix, okay? So they do exhibit numerical problems. So a high order degree polynomial is a naive solution, we cannot use it. We need to build sequences of interpolating polynomials. So we need to build sequences of function. And for example, here, you have uh, a sequence of uh, interpolating by guarantee continuity in the velocities that is different from zero, or you can impose uh, the velocity is null in a various point, okay? So there are some specific way to handle the via point issue, but we are not going to do it here. The textbook has it. There are some, a lot of uh, possibilities, but no, no problem. Another, another degree of freedom is given when uh, the via point is actually a via point. And I say, okay, you have to pass from here, but you can stay two millimeters uh, close, okay? Not far than two millimeters. It means that uh, I'm not giving a via point. I'm giving a sphere of two millimeters radius. And you can pass here. It's a, an additional degree of freedom, okay? And so there are specific algorithms to do it, but you can pass without stopping. Is the, the movement is nicer. So okay. giving like a sphere gives more freedom to the to the, to the algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same. I, I I want to go from Casino to Rome, passing to Formia, but ten kilometers far from Formia. Let me say. So I don't need to go the major of Formia. I can go on the tangential for <laughs> okay so this is what there are several several possibilities uh, and uh, uh, we may we break here before going in the operational space okay we make 10 minutes 10 minutes break <laughs>